Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Aaron Blade, and I'm the editor, creator, and producer of what you're watching right now, Blade Talk. If you are new here, welcome, and you found this presentation helpful and informative, do me a huge favor and hit that like button. Do me an even greater favor and subscribe to my channel. I always appreciate all the support that I am given. So I recently got um, emails, comments about why I don't view the New Testament as authoritative. Okay, and why for me to engage in debating, someone would need to know Hebrew. Okay, so I'm going to go through a few examples in this presentation on why I don't believe in the New Testament and why you shouldn't either. Let's begin. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to get into this. Um, obviously, this comes off the feedback of the presentation that I just did, um, entitled that I don't, I won't sit up here and debate the New Testament because I don't view it as authoritative. I don't believe in it. I think that it has, it contains misapplied passages, misquoted passages. I think that it's anti-Semitic. Um, so there is no way that I'm going to sit here and believe in the New Testament. I'm going to go through examples um, in this presentation on why I don't believe in it. Um, there were some that made the claim that, you know, um, the doctor such and such would destroy you or this person would destroy me in a debate or whatever the case may be. And here's the thing, right? If it takes someone with a theology degree or a scholar or whatever the case may be to quote unquote destroy me, then I think I'm doing pretty good considering the fact that I don't have any smicha. I'm not a rabbi. I don't have a degree in Jewish studies. I don't have, you know, a degree in theology, etc. I'm just a person that was raised Jewish, knows Hebrew, and read the New Testament and sees various inaccuracies in it. Right? So I think that I'm doing pretty good if you need your leaders to essentially, you know, destroy just a simple Jew, right? And even then, you know, I think that they would have a hard time. Right. There are, I'd say, about a million Christians that are smarter than me, that know more about theology, Christianity than I ever will. Similarly, there are about a million, if not more, Muslims that know more about um, Islam, theology, etc. than I ever will. But between the two of them. One of those groups have to be wrong because they're making exclusive claims. One is claiming Jesus, right? And the other is claiming Muhammad. Can they both be right? No. One of those groups have to be wrong. Now, we know as Jews, they're both wrong. But between the two of them, one of them has to be wrong. So the amount of people that are smarter or more intelligent is irrelevant. So the big question is, is can you attack the, fact, attack the facts that I present instead of me as a person, right? Is the power of the message, not the image of the messenger. Can you actually attack what I am claiming? And I'm citing sources. I'm giving, you know, biblical verses, etc., just as I'm going to do in this presentation on why I don't believe in the New Testament. So let's begin. Let's start off with Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, okay? States that young Jesus and his family came to reside in Nazareth so that it might be fulfilled through the scripture saying, he shall be called a Nazarene. The words, he shall be called a Nazarene, do not appear in the Hebrew scriptures at all. As a matter of fact, no one from Nazareth nor the city of Nazareth is ever mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures. It's just not there. You tell me what your your bishop or doctor such and such would say about that passage. It's just not there. Period. 
Let's move on. Matthew chapter 27 verses 9 through 10 states Judas regretted his part participation in getting Jesus arrested for 30 pieces of silver. He is depicted here trying to return the silver. He eventually throws it in the temple and goes off to hang himself. The priest decides to use the silver to purchase a potter's field, um, a cemetery for the uh, unknown. Matthew chapter 27 verse 9 and 10 state that this was done to fulfill the prophecy which was spoken through the prophet, and they took 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the, uh, the potter's field as the Lord directed me. There is no such passage in the book of Jeremiah at all. At all. It's just not there. These are Christian fabrications. They are literally making this up right in front of you. Go grab your Bible and look at the footnote. They are literally just making up things. And this is what I'm supposed to believe in, in terms of the New Testament. This is what, you know, your doctors or your bishop are going to explain to me. It's just not there. You can't make something appear out of nowhere, right? Let's move on. John chapter 2, verse 17. We are presented with a passage in which Jesus is upset about the money changers in the temple. He makes a whip and drives out Jews um, out of the temple. It states, the disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The problem with this passage is that it's from um, Psalms chapter 69, verse 9, if I'm not mistaken. Um, is this not a messianic prophecy? And if Christians want to argue that it is, then you have to go a couple verses before because it will present a major problem with Christian theology that holds that Jesus was sinless. The person praying in Psalm chapter 69 is a sinner. Let's reach out to Psalms chapter 69 verse 5. O Elohim, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. So unless Christians want to say that Jesus was a foolish sinner, they can't use this verse. Let's move on to what Jesus himself said. John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus states that whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Again, this is just a made up verse. Put it in the comment section down below. I'll read it. Where is this verse? John chapter 7, verse 38. What is Jesus referencing here? It's just not there. It is. It, it is com completely made up and is right in front of you. This is why I don't view the New Testament as authoritative. Let's keep going. What did Jesus say next? Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, he lays out what you must do. You must hate your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and even your own life. Otherwise, such a person can't be my disciple. This is Jesus talking. In order to be a follower of Jesus, you have to hate your mother, your father, your children, etc. Now, some Christians like to claim this is a, this is a in comparison, right? You're supposed to love Jesus more than anything else. Two problems with this. One is the Messiah was never meant to demand such devotion to him. The idea is the Messiah is going to um, bring you closer to God right? Not to him specifically, right? The Messiah is just going to be a great prophet and a political figure, but he isn't going to demand that you love him more than anyone else, right? Second issue is that from the moment a prophet or Messiah says that you have to hate your mother and your father, we are to disregard it and deem that person as a false prophet because it goes against the law. The Torah, the Torah is clear that it states that you shall honor your mother and your father. You shall love your, your children. You shall love your brothers and, you know, as you love yourself. It is clear in the Torah. Now you have Jesus going against that, saying that you must hate your brother. You must hate your children. You must hate your own life. And if you don't, then you're not truly a follower of Jesus. He said it himself. Let's move on. Now, let's get into some issues that, with the New Testament that are right in front of your face. You can look it up yourself. Okay, let's start with Matthew chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Mary and Joseph take the baby Jesus and flee to Egypt, where they remain until after King Herod's death. So that which will... 
which was said by the prophets would be fulfilled. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Sounds impressive until one checks the source. Go to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt did I call my son. The author of Matthew ripped half of the verse to make it appear as if it's talking about Jesus. It was a lament about Israel, and the author of Matthew ripped the verse in half. This is the book that I'm supposed to believe in and view as the word of God. Okay. It gets worse. Let's do another one. Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Probably the mo one of the most misapplied passages for telling the virgin birth story, right? Now, it states that all of this took place, so that which was fulfilled by the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is obviously the, the prophet invoked here is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Okay, If we put the verses side by side, you will see that in Isaiah, it states the mother will call his name Emmanuel, while Matthew has an unidentified they will call his name Emmanuel. Right? Now, this passage is in Isaiah. This passage in Isaiah is a sign for King Ahaz. Okay, so a little bit of backstory. Isaiah was sent to King Ahaz. King Ahaz was a wicked king. Okay, you had the um, the uh, Assyrian Empire, right, and then you had the kingdom of Israel, Damascus, and Judah, okay? And what the kingdom of Israel and Damascus wanted to do was band together all three, um, Ju uh, Judah, the kingdom of Israel, and Damascus would all band together to take on the Assyrian Empire, okay? But the kingdom of Judah refused. And when that happened, Damascus and the kingdom of Israel declared war on Judah to try to um, replace the king, essentially, and put someone in there that would help him, right? But the kingdom of Judah, essentially, went around and bargained with Assyria, the Assyrian Empire, right? So, King, um, the prophet Isaiah went to King Ahaz and stated that there is a child, there is a woman who is with child, doesn't say virgin, and all those verbs are actually in the present tense, okay? There is a woman that is with child, and before that child knows right to choose right from wrong, the two kingdoms that you dread will be laid to waste. That is the sign for King Ahaz. That's the sign. Now, keep in mind, this is 700 plus years before Jesus arrives on the scene. 700 years. Okay? Now, ask a simple question to Christians. What two nations were laid to waste at the time of Jesus? Before he, can, he knew to accept what is right, what is good, and reject what is wrong. What two, what two armies, what two nations were laid to waste? Because it's clear that this prophecy came to pass at the time of Isaiah. The kingdom of Israel and Damascus had their armies, and a miracle took place in which their armies never made it to Judah. Before that child knew right from wrong, those armies were laid to waste. And it further states in the very next chapter what the the sign were or who the sign was. It was Isaiah's own children. If you read Isaiah chapter 8, it clearly states that his children were signs. Again, misapplied passages. They are taking things out of context to make it appear as if it's about Jesus when it's not. Let's move on. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 states the famous sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Cross-reference that. You can do it right here, right now. Cross-reference that with Psalms chapter 40 verse 6 where this came from. Read it for yourself. Psalms chapter 40 verse 6 states, Sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. 
essentially to in order to obey the law which you would like as opposed to sin offerings right hebrews ripped the verse out of his context did the same thing that matthew did they ripped the verse out of its context they're doing it right in front of you there's nothing about a body being prepared in psalms chapter 40 verse 6 they're doing it right in front of you and if you don't know hebrew then you're being manipulated. You're being tricked. I'm not getting paid by anyone. I'm not asking, you know, for money from anyone. I'm trying to spread knowledge. I'm trying to spread and get you to understand that you're being taken for a ride. You're being manipulated because you don't know Hebrew. Let's move on. John chapter 8 verse 58. Christians like to cite this as a as a passage to claim the divinity of Jesus. Okay, it states the famous before Abraham was I am, right? He is referencing Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. Moses asked God, who shall I say sent me? And God responds, I am who I am, right? So naturally Christians will link that verse to uh, what is what Jesus stated in John chapter 8 verse 58. I am what I am. See, Jesus called himself I am, so that means that Jesus is God, right? Not exactly, okay? If you read Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 in Hebrew, it states, Ahaya, Asha, Ahaya. What does that mean? What does that mean in Hebrew? Ahaya, Asha, Ahaya. Does it mean I am who I am? It means I will be what I will be. So now the reference that Jesus is making here makes no sense. But in the Christian Bible, in the English translation, they won't translate it to I will be what I will be because it messes up the entire, you know, the prophecy and whatnot, right? It messes up the entire reference. So they leave it alone. But that is not what it says in Hebrew, and they won't change it. You're being taken for a ride. You're being manipulated. Let's go to what Paul says, okay? Paul, in one of his most famous writings, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, states that I received, um, I from what I received, I passed to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scripture? Put it in the comments down below. What scripture? Point it out. No one had this belief that the Messiah was going to die for your sins. Right? No one had that, that belief. Even when Jesus stated to Peter that I'm going to die, Peter states, far be that from you. This should never happen to you. No Jew expected for the Messiah to come and die for the sins of the world, then come back and do everything. No one expected that. And Paul is quoting, you know, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scripture? He didn't even give a verse. It's just not there, period. Again, they are taking you for a ride. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. I can keep going. It states, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified um, with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Everything is purified with blood. There is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Okay, let's look at what the law actually says. Leviticus chapter 5 states that if anyone sins amongst the children of Israel, they are to bring a female lamb that is free of blemish or a goat from the flock as a sin offering and give it to the priest. If they cannot afford that, then they are to bring two doves or two pigeons to the priest as a sin offering. If they cannot afford the two doves, or two pigeons, they are to bring their finest flour as a sin offering to the priest. The priest will burn it on the altar according to the law. Their sins will be forgiven. How much blood is in flour? 
how much blood is in flour. Now you have Hebrews stating that without the shedding of blood, your sins cannot be forgiven, implying that you have to rely on Jesus. You, this is this is the part where they're they're essentially forcing Jesus in because they're making the claim that you need you have to have blood in order for your sins to be forgiven. But according to Leviticus chapter five, someone could bring flour and their sins will be forgiven. How much blood is in flour? You let me know. Revelations chapter two, verse nine, Israelites, Hebrew Israelites love this passage. Okay. It states the following. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Okay. Now, again, I don't view the New Testament as authoritative. I think this is crap, right? But let's play what if. What if I did um, grant the premise that the New Testament was authoritative and I read this verse, okay? Context matters. They like to claim that this is about the Jews. More specifically, they say they are Jews and but are not. They are actually from the synagogue of Satan. The issue is, is that it's pulled out of context, okay? Revelations chapter 2, okay, are letters attributed to specific churches in ancient Greek cities, right? If you read the Revelations chapter 2, again, there for specific churches. This, this passage, Revelations chapter 2 verse 9, is specifically for the church in Smyrna. Right? There's another letter um, that was sent um, to the church of in uh, Ephesus, right? These are churches in old cities in ancient Greeks, okay? Now, now all of a sudden they're supposed to be directed at Jews, right? You are plucking it out of this context, a lament about the ch a church, in an old Greek city and making it appear as if it's for Jews around the world that claim to be Jews. Really? You're going to take Revelations chapter 2 verse 9 out of this context. They're talking about a church in Smyrna. That's what that's where this letter was sent to and you're somehow making it appear as if this is for anyone that claims that they are Jews. There was another letter sent to, again, Ephesus, right? Which would be modern-day Turkey. They're sent to specific churches, and you're trying to make it seem as if it's for Jews all around the world. Okay. Let's look at another one. Matthew chapter 22, verse 44, often quoted by Christians, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Christians like to claim that King David stated, The Lord said to my Lord, then who is King David's Lord? Right? Even Jesus um, asked the question. You know, they like to claim that it is Jesus. Who is at the right hand of God? It's Jesus. Right? Who else could it be? You have the passage that both the L's are capitalized and King David is speaking. Right? The Lord said to my Lord. Again, knowing Hebrew is critical because they're doing it right in front of you. They are manipulating you. And the fact that you don't know Hebrew, they're taking advantage of it. Okay? The Hebrew doesn't support this at all. Let's go to Psalms chapter 110, verse 1. Now, if you read the Hebrew, you already know where I'm, if you read Hebrew, you already know where I'm about to go with this, with, with this because it's clear. Okay. It is right in front of you. Bear with me as I try to teach the others that don't know. If you don't know Hebrew, just look at the fourth and the fifth words, okay? Remember that Hebrew is read right to left. Okay. The fourth word is the name of Hashem. We never 
ever utter that word, okay? It is yud, a he, a vav, and then another he, okay? We never say that word, okay? It is the unequivocal name of God. The next word is la, a, do, ni, okay? Those are the letters. You can clearly see that the words are different, even if you don't know Hebrew. You know shapes, I'm assuming. The shapes are different. You can clearly see that they're different. Now, this is strange because the English version has them as the same word. But this is the, the Hebrew. It is clear right in front of you. They are clearly not the same word in Hebrew, right? So... If we pull up both, you can see that, again, these words are completely different. Not only that, let's pull up another Psalms, okay? Psalm chapter 23, verse 1, okay? If you look at the Hebrew, it says, Miss Mor La David, okay? What does that mean, a song of David, right? King David is the author. Now let's go back to Psalms chapter 110 verse 1 and tell me what has changed in the Hebrew, okay? If you are paying attention then the passage, in, in this passage, the words are essentially reversed. It means, la David miss more, right? Now look at the translations in the English Bible. Do they reverse it too? No, they do not. Now, what is the difference if you reverse them? Again, those that know Hebrew... You know, you see it clear as day. Those that don't, what is the difference between um, La David Mismore and Mismore La David? If it states what, uh, if it states La David Mismore, it means to David a song. So who is singing this? The Levites. This is not from King David. King David isn't singing this. It literally states a song to David. The Christian Bible, the English version, chooses not to reverse it. They're doing this right in front of you. They, cho they are choosing not to rearrange the words so that it appears, the way that it is written in Hebrew, a song to King David. So look at the manipulation of what the New Testament does. There is no way that anyone who truly knows and understands could believe it. Right? They are playing games with the Word of God, and they are counting on you not knowing Hebrew in order to manipulate you. They are doing it right in front of you, right? Look at the historical inaccuracies. Pontius Pilate, a vicious anti-Semite, had the king of the Jews on trial, right? And he just wanted to let him go. Found no fault with, with Jesus, right? just wanted to let him go. And we know that Pontius Pilate was recalled back to Rome because he was so barbaric to the Jews. And now you have the king of the Jews right in front of you. And you state the following. I wash my hands with this, right? I see no fault with this, with this man. He's completely innocent, right? But it's the Jews. It's the Jews that just scream crucify him. Crucify him and let the blood be on our hands and our children's hands. Really? Imagine for a second that Hitler had a leader of the Jews. Okay? Had a leader of the Jews and stated the same thing. Right? I see no fault in this, in this Jewish man. But then you have other Jews telling Hitler, you must crucify him. You think Hitler needed a reason to crucify or kill Jews? No. So, 
This whole notion that Pontius Pilate and some Christians have made him a saint. But this whole notion that Pontius Pilate was innocent, he didn't really want to do anything, he didn't want to really be involved, and it was the Jews that was clamoring and forcing his hand, and he didn't want, you know, an uprising or whatever the case may be, and it's just historically inaccurate. He was recalled back to Rome because he was so vicious. Let alone a bunch of Jews that, according to the New Testament, believed that this was the Messiah. We're going to urge, you know, Pontius Pilate to kill the Messiah. The whole story just doesn't make sense. All right. So, no. You know, and, and from what I've seen in the New Testament, every time knowledgeable Jews approached Jesus, he always got upset and lashed out, right? Um, you evil generation, you adulterous generation, you are the children of Satan, your father is Satan, you go to the synagogue of Satan, etc., etc. Always remember something, the truth does never mind being questioned, a lie does, right? It is easy to fool people that don't know Hebrew or know history. But they didn't count on this channel, all right? Then when someone does come along and knows Hebrew and knows their Jewish history, some are so devoted to the lie that they have to attack me, my character, and say that I'm wrong, etc., etc. They don't attack the arguments that I just put forth because they know they can't. Like I said, once you know Hebrew, and it, it's not a hard language to actually learn, you'll see if you put a Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament together, side by side, you will see certain things do not make sense. This was purposely done. It was purposely done that they manipulate certain texts, certain words, to try to force Jesus in. Which is why I don't believe in the New Testament. They're forcing things in. They're even making up references right in front of you. And they're counting on the fact that you don't know the Hebrew scriptures in order to do it. And that is the truth. And I'm on this platform to try to um, present the truth. They are counting on the fact that you don't know Hebrew, right? Uh, th this often passage in Matthew chapter 22, verse 44, you know, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. That is talking about King David, right? And if you know Hebrew, it becomes very clear. It's very clear because the words aren't the same, but yet in the Christian Bible, in the Christian Bible, they won't change it. They capitalize the L and they capitalize the other L. The Lord said to my Lord. It's interesting. There are no um, capital letters in Hebrew. They're manipulating you into believing something and it's just not true. And this whole um, idea of, you know, uh, this whole idea that they're doing this right in front of you should be an insult to you. It should make you want to read Hebrew and learn Hebrew. Because I guarantee I just scratched the surface. There are way more than this. Right? So, no, I'm not interested in debating the New Testament because it comes with references that are just completely made up. Not only that, again, as I stated, the Protestants only have 60, 66 books. The Catholics have 73 books. Right? What happened to those, those other books? If it's the word of God, who are you to throw those books out? They keep revising the Bible, the King James Version, the New International Version, the American Standard Version, the Queen James Version. 
And no, these aren't, well, it's just translations and it makes it easier to read. No, they're throwing out entire verses. They're manipulating the text. That's why I can't get on board with the New Testament. They are literally manipulating the entire book. It cannot be the word of God. It has been tampered with way too many times. To the point of, as I stated, you know, they're just misapplying, misappropriating, taking things out of context, and just flat out making up references right in front of you. And they're counting on the fact that you don't know Hebrew. I don't believe in the New Testament, and neither should you. Again, I'm just scratching the surface. Go learn Hebrew and compare it side by side. And you will see, huh, this word is changed, but they didn't change it in the English version. And they did this on purpose. And I don't care, you know, what your... What bishop you have in mind, what person could destroy me, or whatever the case may be, you can't make up references out of thin air. Period. Right? There's the, in the Christian Bible, the New Testament, they are constantly doing this. Right? Isaiah 53 is about Jesus. No, it's not. It's the fourth of four servant songs and it states multiple times that Israel is the servant but they take things out of context because it it seems it sounds like Jesus you're trying to force Jesus in and if you have to do that then that alone is clear is proof to me that Jesus isn't the messiah because there's nothing about you know, belief in the Messiah when he comes. We will all know who the Messiah is, just as we will all know who God is. That is what Isaiah said, stated plainly. From the least to the greatest, everyone will know God. Everyone. There will be no more atheists. Everyone will know God. And there will be universal peace. And if you truly believe in the Hebrew scriptures, you truly believe in the Old Testament, then I'll ask a question. Do you believe that Zechariah was a prophet? If you said yes, then it states very clearly in the book of Zechariah that at the time of the day of the Lord, right, this messianic prophecy, 10 people from 10 different nations will grab firm hold to a Jew and say, please let us go with you because now we know that God has always been with you. Please let us go with you. They will grab hold to a Jew. To a Christian? No. To a Muslim? No. Hebrew Israelites? No. To a Jew. And say, let us go with you because now we know that God has always been with you. Prophet Jeremiah prophesied that you will have people that will come and say our ancestors lied to us. In which there is no prophet. So all these promises about heaven and, and Jenna and paradise and, you know, 72 virgins and all this other stuff that these other religions are promising you. Prophet Jeremiah is prophesying that in those days, in the messianic age, they will come to the realization that their ancestors were lied to. They were lied to. Teaching about gods that aren't gods. 
and there is no profit for serving them. You were lied to. So for me, again, this is why I don't accept the New Testament. If you read the Hebrew, if you learn Hebrew, you read it in its original language, you will see multiple translation issues. And it will upset you. It will piss you off. Because they did this on purpose. They did this on purpose in order to force Jesus in. So, if you found this presentation helpful and informative, do me a huge favor and hit that like button. Do me an even greater favor and subscribe to my channel. I always appreciate all the support that I am given. Thank you all so much for tuning in to Blade Talk. Be good to yourselves. Be good to others. And until the next episode, you all take care.